You may not be aware of this, but on Wednesday mornings at 9.30, I come into this room to tape promos for our television broadcast. The room looks a little different than it does at the moment. The lights are off. There's a television camera right down here on the floor and some lights focused on a spot on the carpet where I'm supposed to stand. So I come in wearing my suit and David Powers clips on my microphone. Alan Cumbia focuses the camera and John Pettigrew adjusts the lights. And then when Alan gives me the signal, I'm supposed to read something off the teleprompter that will entice those people watching Channel 8 on Sunday morning to stay tuned for the 11 o'clock broadcast. That part is not so hard. What's hard is when we look ahead to the following week and I'm supposed to promote a worship service that hasn't even happened yet. I mean, I've thought about it. I've sat down with the worship team to talk about it, but I'm always a little surprised when I look up at the teleprompter and it says something from next week's sermon. I, I can't really blame the people who type the text into the teleprompter. They don't know what I'm going to be preaching about next Sunday, but sometimes I don't either. And I have to, to gather my thoughts and remember, what is it that I'm preaching about next Sunday? I, I know I've thought about, what is it? What am I going to say? Sometimes I have to make it up right there on the spot. And I look into the camera and say with confidence, next week we'll be talking about whatever it is. Last Wednesday, I stood down here, looked into the camera and said, if you believed that someday you would stand before God, wouldn't you want to stand on his good side? We'll talk about it Sunday morning at 11. Well, here we are. Sunday morning at 11, and I've promised our entire television congregation that we'll be talking about standing before God. So, let's talk about it. Do you really believe that's going to happen someday? That you are going to stand before God? Do you? I don't need a show of hands. I'd just like to see you nodding if you think that's yes. See, I do. I believe that. And I may believe it because of what the Bible says about it. In Revelation 20, 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Romans 14, 12 says, Every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that we must all appear before the judgment seat. I believe, and maybe it's because of what the Bible says, but it may be because of a gospel tract that I saw when I was a boy called This Was Your Life. Maybe you've seen it. It's a little black and white comic book, but it's not all that funny. It tells the story of a, a smug self-satisfied, successful man who suddenly drops dead of a heart attack. And before he knows what's happening, he finds himself standing before the throne of God, watching as his whole life is replayed on a movie screen. This was your life, it says, and shows a picture of him as a baby. Oh, he says, that's not so bad. But then it shows him as a teenager, telling some of his friends a dirty story. And a little later as a young man lusting after a pretty girl. And later in his adult life, committing every conceivable sin. When the angel opens the Lamb's Book of Life, it is no surprise that his name is not found in its pages. He falls to his knees and says, I'm lost, without hope, without Christ. I'm guilty, guilty. And then on cue, a big burly angel comes and drags him away and tosses him into the lake of fire. But if you had asked this man before he died, he would have said that he was a good man, living a good life. And that's what I've been thinking about this past week. I've been thinking that we all have a way of justifying our beliefs and our behavior of making them right in our own mind if no one else's. When I talk to people who don't believe in God, or those who do but don't come to church, they don't usually think of themselves as bad people. 
No, they think of all the good things they've done, and some of those things have been very good indeed. These are people who have helped to eradicate poverty in some parts of the world. People have done their part to protect the environment. Some who have tried to stop AIDS in Africa. They don't believe they will ever stand before God, but if they did, they would be happy to tell him that they've been just as good as anyone and better than some. And yet that might not be enough. The question that lies beneath today's sermon is, what makes us right with God? And the answer may be found in this parable from Luke 18. Jesus begins by saying that two men went up to the temple to pray. One of them was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. You can tell right away that these are two stock characters in his stories, meant to represent the opposite ends of the moral spectrum. One of them is the worst person you can think of, and one of them is the best person you can think of. These two go up to the temple to pray. If you really do try to think about the worst person you know, the most sinful person in your acquaintance, it's a little hard, isn't it, to think of that person uh, coming to church, entering into the presence of God. If this person Jesus is talking about is a real person, you can imagine how difficult this would have been for him to go to the temple, to enter into God's presence, to pray. The Pharisee, on the other hand, is happy to be there. And if you can, think of this Pharisee as a real person too. Someone you know, maybe your favorite deacon, or your Sunday school teacher, someone who is, in the very best sense of that word, a righteous man. In his comments on this passage, Paul Duke says that what the parable neglects to mention is that the Pharisee was singing Amazing Grace on his way to church that day, or that as he said his prayer, there were tears in his eyes. He feels this stuff, Duke says. He is awash with religious emotion, truly moved to gratitude for the life God has blessed him to live. Ask him on his way out what he thinks of the tax collector, and he will tell you, there, but for the grace of God, go I. And he will think that he means it. So what's the problem? The problem is his prayer. He doesn't only thank God for the life he is blessed to live, doesn't only thank him that he is not a thief, a rogue, an adulterer, or a tax collector. He thanks God that he is not like those people. He is trying to justify himself, to make himself right, and he does it by looking around at everybody else. Having looked around, he looks at himself, and he likes what he sees. Look at me, he says, here I am in the temple praying. Not only that, but I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I receive. He's a good man, isn't he? A righteous man. Honestly, I wish I had a church full of people as righteous as he is. But is all his tithing and fasting and praying enough? And will it be enough on the day he stands before God? 